As we discussed in our Blade Runner 2049 analysis, we do not have time for intimacy anymore, where the character Joy is basically a porn product that replaces real relationships with people in the age of AI. Pornography thus acts as a surrogate to real sex for the sake of capitalistic efficiency and commoditized consumption. In Serial Experiments Lane, the term infonography is used to denote how information is consumed on a pornographic scale. To Alexander Bard, the term pornoflation is used to denote the idea that man no longer desires since he is barraged with such excessive information, an inflation of taboo information that essentially knows no restrictions, leaving him with little to no libido left. Much like Land mentioned, we are being delighted to death away from Eros and thrown into the arms of Thanatos. We see a death as a form of unlife, tied to the crypt. In psychoanalysis, for both Freud and Lacan, there is both Eros and Thanatos, the drive towards life and death. To Lacan, we must remember that due to a sense of lack, the objet petit a remains the unattainable object of our desire. Unattainable, of course, since it exists in the imaginary realm or order. Psychoanalysis, of course, also focuses on repressing desires that would otherwise be catastrophic to civilization. With Deleuze being but desiring machines, desire is not repressed and thus allows us to transform through the body without organs into something other. It is fundamentally an alchemic process of transfiguration. Land, of course, uses the Deleuzian model extensively. The signification of the phallus, of course, is lost, however, once logos is replaced by nomos. It is only in terms of meaning that the signification of the phallus holds sway. This is another reason why Deleuze and Guattari deal with diagrams and not ideals or ideologies linked to discourse. Of course, men being linguistically inclined creatures will always value meaning, and thus meaning becomes the commodity man most wishes to acquire found through the signification of the Lacanian phallus, which again stands as the square root of minus one, since it is an imaginary measure. Rather than relying on psychoanalysis, schizoanalysis offers a more alchemic interpretation on desire as we've since discussed. Alchemy, of course, is fundamentally a Taoist practice in many respects, linking death with life and thus making man immortal in some sense, as well as resting itself outside the need for signification. Fuk Zen monks denote this well, preferring the sound of flutes over their own words. As Rapound references this as well in his Pisan Cantos, where men who make foolish things with their mouths have their mouths removed. Associated with alchemy as well as death is one of the eight immortals in Taoism, Zhongli Quan. Quan has with him a large fan, which can resurrect the dead as well as grant him the alchemic ability to transmute stones into pieces of silver and gold. Silver, of course, representing the feminine, moon, and gold, the masculine sun, in alchemical terms. Taoist teachings, of course, rely upon internal alchemy, or nidan, as a means to make an immortal spiritual body that could survive after death. Much like how hermetic alchemy focuses on the three primes, mercury, sulfur, and salt, Taoist alchemy concerns itself with the three treasures, ying or essence, qi or energy, and shen, spirit. If we would like to stick to the subject of libido, one of the primary alchemical means of building one's Tao and attaining immortality or longevity was to engage in the art of the bedchamber, or coitus, as a means of joining energies with the opposite aspects of ourselves, personified through our partners where yang is typically male and yin is typically feminine. The important aspect was to please one's partner, for only in that way could each benefit from each other's shared energy. We see similar ideals expressed in tantric sex and Buddhism, as well, of course, in many forms of sex magic. In fact, in Chinese mythology, there are the peaches of immortality, which provide longevity to all who eat them. Peach banquets were held by the Jade Emperor and the Queen Mother of the West, who is considered the dispenser of immortality, who connects earth to the heavens as well as the east with the west. The old wise sages of the east had an obsession with peaches, it seems, as do most modern-day men. In the Buddhist sense, desire is the source of all suffering. Perhaps that is the greatest fear of all, that without desire, all will stagnate and remain the same. 
man will become immortal, and he will head towards his ordered heaven without a chance for change. Parmenides will take Heraclitus' place, where all flux falls to stasis. This is why Chinese alchemy is so important to understand. Like Deleuzian models, it accounts for multiplicities. It equates pluralistic and monistic forms of thought, all the while remaining open and empty. For it is from the Wuji, and through elemental alchemy, that the 10,000 things emerge. All energy remains at zero, neither created nor destroyed, but from it all things flourish, transferred and transmuted alchemically from state to state. Here, life and death are linked. Like yin and yang, Parmenides and Heraclitus benefit from each other's shared energies. Heraclitus, in a sense, is Parmenides' peach.